Hey all. So, a while back, uh, basically at the start of the summer, I decided I would do a re-edit of Ghostbusters 2016, or as most people have come to call it, Ghostbusters Answer the Call, which apparently was the working title, it was the conceptual title, it was the title that they went with throughout production, and then when they released it, they just called it Ghostbusters, But then Answer the Call was part of the title. It was there in the end credits. It was the whole thing. So I was like, well, why wouldn't you include that as part of it? It was so weird. But it was part of the trailer, but then they just didn't bother billing it as that. So it was a bit annoying. Anyway, so I did a fan edit of the film, and it turned out really well. I was amazed because um, I wasn't sure how salvageable the film was, but I did only an edit of subtraction. I didn't add in any um, deleted scenes or anything like that. And the inspiration for it came when I was watching uh, Ghostbusters on cable. I just flipped to it. And it entered into this scene where it just got off into this weird tangent. Now, for those who don't know, uh, there's a rule that I tried to exercise in the editing process called Chekhov's gun. If something is in the scene and it doesn't serve to further advance the scene or it doesn't serve to further advance the story, then there is no reason to have it there. If it stands out, if attention is called to it, if anything like that happens, leave it out. Because it's just going to distract the audience and weigh down the story and not really bring anything to it. Now, in a comedy, you might say, oh, well, what about jokes? There's got to be jokes. It's a comedy. Well, yes and no. A comedy can have funny situations and no jokes. The comedy itself can come from gags and bits and scenes with funny stuff happening. Uh, There are a lot of cases where this succeeds and a lot of cases where this fails. Uh, One instance where, one or two instances where uh, these can go very right is um, just looking at the Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor catalog that they've done together. You've got uh, Silver Streak and Stir Crazy, both really surprisingly good. And Blazing Saddles was going to be one of those, but Richard Pryor, I guess, had an obligation or something like that. I don't know the exact story on that at this point. But anyway, so the fun part there was all the little ins and outs and the way that the characters interacted and there were lots of funny scenes but nothing weighed the story down or dragged it off into a whole weird area for no reason whereas some scenes in uh, other films that they did uh, like um, oh uh, hear no evil see no evil Uh, Or I think I have that reversed. I think it's see no evil, hear no evil. Anyway, um, they did that, and they did another one that really bombed at the box office called Another Another You. Um, That one, the title made no sense, and they changed the script right in the middle of everything. Um, So that instead of happening in one location, it happened in a completely other location. So it was a really weird uh, bit of film. And you can tell that stuff that's happening in the story is really contrived as a result of the rewrite and the changes that they made to the script. With all that being said, um, those ones did not do quite as well. They were like built up because, oh, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder are back. And, but, you know, especially with um, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, that one was very prominently billed, and it wasn't that bad in all. Uh, But it was lacking a certain something. 
And then by the time he got to uh, do the film Another You, the actors who were playing sort of uh, tertiary characters were much, much stronger. So when we take that example and apply it to Ghostbusters, you have the most anticipated sequel in decades. And they decide that they're going to just completely reboot the franchise with new characters, none of the old characters. You'll have cameos by the actors from uh, the first franchise. And I think they got back everyone except for Harold Ramis because he was passed. Um, Now that I think about it. Anyway, and they had some really good celebrity cameos who were just playing parts in the story. Uh, Andy Garcia as the mayor, for one. But the problem came when Paul Feig decided that he was going to make the story and then just leave the camera on for these really funny women to improvise a lot of jokes and lines. And when those scenes occur, it, you know, they basically come up with a funny thing and then just have the actors go and go and go, and they'll have that them do that for like, I don't know, five or ten minutes, and then give them a break, and then they can come back to it and try some more jokes, and then in the editing room see what sticks. Now, I heard about uh, the same thing happening uh, with, um, oh, another movie... And I'm trying to remember which one it was off the top of my head, and I'm not remembering. But the point is, sometimes you'll do that. Some I, I remember now, it was uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Very popular film. Came out not too dissimilar time from Ghostbusters. There, um, John Hughes decided to leave the camera on for a lot of little improvisation scenes, and he ended up with a movie that was two hours and 45 minutes in the rough cut. So they had to edit it down, and they ended up eventually having it turn from more of a drama with some comedic moments to just pure comedy. And they ended up doing a lot of um, play with everything, having the parade scene come later in the film. Uh you know, closer to the end of the day, more as the climax. It's like, okay, now they can go no crazier than that. Now they're done for the day, and they can go home. So, as as everything... Because uh, I was watching a behind-the-scenes of the development of that film. As As they were filming, they had all of those improvisational scenes that worked and they were really good and the scenes that are in the film that feature a lot of the improvisation are really good it wasted a bit of the actor's time and energy to do all that improvisation and apparently they ended up losing some characters uh louis anderson as a flower delivery guy talking with uh the vice principal um two younger siblings to the bueller household So, you know, they had a lot of movie there, enough almost to make an entire side film of just everything else that was going on that day. But they ended up leaving it out. And one of the reasons why they left it out is because of the principle of Chekhov's gun. Uh, That principle basically, for those who don't know, Let me give you a bit of backstory. I talk about this in the fan edit because I give a few notes at the beginning, some points in the middle, and then at the end. A lot at the end. Basically an essay. But it's uh, just uh, in text. It's not in in audio or anything. Anyway, so with, um, with Chekhov... He was a Russian playwright, and a lot of people really admired his work. His stories tend to be really good. Uh, His work was well-respected. It was easy to stage. 
Uh, and there was a lot of room for variability so that the directors and the actors could play up a show their way rather than having it all be exactly the same. So it, it allowed for a loose enough framework that people could really run with it artistically. Chekhov uh, was asked, you know, like how to work a story better. And so he had a, uh, he would get a lot of mail from people about this. And so he came up with some guiding principles uh, for writing a screen, or writing a play rather, not a screenplay. But you can apply it to writing a screenplay. And in that instance, you have um, several different suggestions, but the m most well known of many of them is Chekhov's gun, which is the idea that if you have a gun um, hanging over the mantle in uh, scene one or act one or anything like that, and, you know, like attention is called to it specifically, it's not just set decoration or something then uh, it should be used by Act 3 at some point. And that really gives you a lot of framework, because then if you introduce something, you can think of ways to use it. Like, oh, are, how are you going to use this gun? If it's a comedy, oh, maybe it'll be used to shoot someone in the butt, because that would be funny. And they'll run away in indignation, but they'll basically be okay. Or if it's uh, a drama, then maybe the gun will be used to resolve the drama somehow. Like, uh, the the husband will be under attack from um, a dog or, uh, or a bad person like a robber or some other villain. And uh, the wife or the son or something will get out the gun and shoot whoever the bad guy is. So that's basically the idea of Chekhov's gun. Something that's introduced has to be used later. Something that's introduced and takes up valuable time for the audience has to somehow serve the story. And that's the big problem with a lot of Paul Feig's direction on Ghostbusters Answer the Call. A lot of the s scenes and dialogue do not serve to advance the story at all. And it got to be really frustrating for me when I would be watching the scenes and enjoying myself, and then I would be like, oh my god, we're being dragged off into this whole territory again. One of the worst offenders in this was Melissa McCarthy and the running gag with her wontons. And it it drove me a little bit nuts, because I'm like, is this going somewhere or is this just going to keep come coming up and not really be funny? It's just funny because she's speaking in a Chicago accent about wontons. Anyway, so you get my point. Uh, a lot of the dialogue from Chris Hemsworth, who was just constantly jumping in with inane banter that wasn't that funny, wasn't that interesting, it just went nowhere, didn't serve the scene. I mean, that's the thing. You can have a name banter, and it can be funny, as long as it serves the scene. But a lot of his stuff was just him shoving lines in, padding his part, so to speak. And most directors don't respond well to an actor padding their part. But Paul Feig went ahead and let Chris Hemsworth just run off at the mouth about anything. And it's like, you know, you might not always remember Janine right off the top of your head, who basically played the same role, but you remember her character. A lot of, you know, you might not remember her right off the top of your head because you might have a favorite character like Ray or Egon or Peter. But you remember a lot of the more poignant scenes featuring the other actors. Um, one of my favorites is always with Winston in the first Ghostbusters film. You know, he and Ray are just in the car. These are two people simply talking. And uh, they start talking about the Bible. And 
Winston says, uh, has it ever occurred to you that we've been so busy because the dead have been rising from the grave? And they just pause. Like, there's a pregnant pause in there. And Ray says, how about some music? And Winston simply says, yeah. And it's both a, yeah, let's listen to some music, as well as, yeah, this is some heavy stuff. You know, we're dealing with some biblical stuff. So then that comes up later in the mayor's office when, you know, they talk about, you know, a disaster of biblical proportions. And the mayor's like, what are you talking about biblical proportions? And it goes right back to something Winston said, just right there in the car. So all in all... When we take a look at Ghostbusters 2016 Answer the Call, yes, it's a bit of an unfair comparison to compare one film by a set of writers and directors and say, okay, now what are you going to do? But this is part of a franchise, which means it might not need to be exactly the same as everything you've seen before, but it should still have some of the good writing and directing. So, when we get dragged off into talking about Patrick Swayze movies, there is no point in that. It's not funny, it doesn't serve the scene, and it doesn't serve the story. When uh, Kate McKinnon's character uh, just suddenly in the mayor's office goes, Why? Just completely out of character and that gets left in the movie, it doesn't make me feel like that actor is taking the part seriously, but it definitely makes me feel more like the uh, the director isn't taking the audience seriously, like the, the director doesn't care about the final product. So um, there are some scenes where it's perfectly okay. It's like, oh, yeah, all right. Leave that line in. That completely works. That serves something later. Uh, Trying to think about um, some of the different stuff in the movie because it's been a while since I watched it. Uh, But one particular instance, uh, Kate McKinnon's character of Shotzi uh, gives uh, Kristen Wiig's character uh, a Swiss Army knife. Well, that actually ends up coming back up later. Because the other Ghostbusters are pinned down in a very screenwriting 101 kind of thing. I wonder if they didn't give it to an intern to write a lot of it. Um, She ends up using that Swiss Army knife to pop one of the balloons that attacks them. That's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. And it works. It's, It's a good integral part of that scene it makes the film uh, a bit more satisfying on that level. But you have to suddenly remember, oh, that's right, she was given the Swiss Army knife. Now that is in the middle of all of this improv that it's a little bit hard to register everything in. Because when you have all of that improvisation shoved in, just one joke after another, line after line after line, it's going to get lost in the wash if you follow. Um, you get delude, deluged rather, uh, with, um, I'm sorry, deluged with um, all of these jokes and lines. And you're supposed to remember one out of about seven or eight separate lines that had none of them had to do with one another none of them built on one another and you're supposed to remember one line out of all of that that somehow calls you back um, later on in the film so one thing that I did in the scene where uh, the Swiss Army Knife is introduced is I edited some of the lines I tidied it up a little bit Uh, There were scenes that I completely cut out, like the scene where they're talking about the dead body 
and all the different things that they could do with it. No need for that. Um, the scene where they're talking about Pringles. There is no need for that. It has nothing to do with anything in the scene or the story. And I like Pringles. It has nothing to do with liking Pringles or whatever. Uh, it just wasn't funny. It was stupid. <laughs> I mean, I'm perfectly okay with like something random happening, but the problem is it has to serve something. It can't just be all random segues, and it can't be stupid. Moving on from that, someone pointed out, um, it, this was in a very heated discussion with regard to my uh, fan edit of the film. Someone pointed out to me that, oh, all family comedies are stupid these days. You know, just go and watch one. So I actually looked up all of the family comedies because Fandango made a list of family comedies. Well, just family films in general. And I looked through for all of the ones that were comedies. Uh, there, there were There was Ghostbusters, and then there was middle school the worst years of my life as the only two live action um comedies released that year every other um family comedy that was released that year was animated think about that okay now every live action film aside from those two was adventure, drama, that kind of thing. Uh, you had Alice Through the Looking Glass, and, uh, oh, you had uh, one of the Allegiant movies, and uh, just all kinds of films like that, where it was usually based on a book or something along those lines. Now, when you actually take a look at that, you have two comedies one is geared specifically towards being family friendly. A kid is going to high school. It's based on a very popular um, children's book. Or not high school, middle school rather. And the principal has like a million rules. And the kid is going to take on the, the principal who instituted all these rules. So you watch that and when I watched uh, the preview for it, because I haven't seen it yet, it actually looked really good. And I thought, this is going to be a way better movie, way smarter. Why didn't I hear about this movie? Well, probably because it wasn't animated and it was not dumbed down for the audience. Now, a lot of animated uh, comedies certainly go for the dumb jokes. Uh, Despicable Me 3 uh, went for a lot of potty humor. That was well documented. Um, Escape, or, or what was it, Home, uh, that was at Home, uh, was um, a lot of potty humor there. You know, they go for it because they think it'll entertain the little kiddos instead of just insulting the audience. Things like that have to be used sparingly. Um, but then you look at Ghostbusters Answer the Call, and what do you get? You get a lot of potty humor. You have, um, a tape recording with a fart. You have Slimer burping with a completely obvious Foley burp. It's not a ghostly burp or anything like that. And it's in there just for gross-out humor. Just for childishness and sophomoricity. Which I don't know if that's a word, but it should be. Anyway, the point is, the film ended up kind of insulting all of its audience. Because there was this built-up outrage about the idea of female Ghostbusters. But most male Ghostbusters fans were like, okay, fine. Just make sure the story is good. That was my response. That was Red Letter Media's response. That was, like, everyone's honest response. There were only a few people who seemed to honestly think that women couldn't be Ghostbusters, and I don't think that they were fans of the series to begin with. Like, I don't think that they watched the cartoon, for sure, 
because Janine was an equal part of the team on the on the cartoon rather, because uh, uh, J. Michael Straczynski knows how to write for women. He doesn't write them as generic woman or something like that. He writes them as well-rounded characters with thoughts, feelings, emotions, backgrounds, everything. Um, anyway, so when we get into a lot of those uh, aspects of what are comedies like these days, you have uh, comparisons that the person who was arguing with me made where she said, oh, it's like Bridesmaids or The Hangover. I'm like, yeah, those popular family films. Uh, so, you know, The Hangover and Bridesmaids were not for families, obviously. Those were very raunchy comedies. Those ones went with improvisation. They went with dumb humor and bathroom humor. One of the reasons why... Um, why Bridesmaids in particular went for that was because part of the idea was that it was an it was a woman it, it was a woman's movie it was by women for women and, and it showed that women weren't afraid to be degraded for comedy so Melissa McCarthy and Maya Rudolph and Kristen Wiig and all these other actresses they were like okay we're gonna let ourselves be degraded on camera for comedy because women can do that too. We don't have to be these porcelain dolls that are funny while we're um, acting so prim and perfect and proper. You know, we can, we have bodies, we have bodily functions, therefore we have bodily function noises as well. Now, I would have been okay with, you know, all of that because that's in an adult comedy. You know, that's one that's geared more towards adolescents and adults. Fair enough. But this is supposed to be a family-friendly adventure comedy. Right? Basically. It's blurring a lot of lines, but that's basically where it kind of sits. The original Ghostbusters films were not family-friendly, by the way. They were not. They had monsters, they were scary, they were more for the adolescent crowd. They didn't try and bill themselves as being some kind of feminist film. And this is coming from someone who's watched a fair number of feminist films. I can pretty readily evaluate where a, where a character is in a film, where a film is... And if it passes, like, the Bechdel test, or the, or Bechdel test, I guess it's pronounced, and the Mako Mori test. So, um, just because I've done a fair number of film study. I'm not saying I'm perfect, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the best at it. I'm simply saying it's something I'm aware of and that I've tried to apply myself to as much as anything else. Uh, so anyway, when we look at it, this film doesn't quite meet the muster. You know, it just doesn't. So when we look at it, how does it hold up overall? And the fact is it doesn't. It ends up hurting itself more because it's not focused enough. The scenes go off on these weird tangents and it ends up hurting so much of the script as well as insulting the audience and you have to have a certain amount of respect for your audience so when I'm sitting there and watching uh, the head of a um, small institute of learning flip off a couple of women well uh, three women uh, anyway uh, not just a couple anyway flip them off and tell them to suck it and then you know gesture for them to get out I'm like this is not a family friendly comedy because those kids are going to imitate that behavior now they're going to see that that's appropriate you know, maybe the boys will imitate that and and think that that's uh, a funny way to deal with women. 
It's a highly imitatable, imitatable behavior. Um, you have just a lot of stuff in the in the film overall that just doesn't quite uh, work. And so I ended up uh, doing the fan edit, and it cut like 20 to 30 minutes out of the film. So when you think about that, 20 to 30 minutes out of the film is a significant portion, but a lot of it is just the improv. Like, I don't even remove that much outside of that. So much of it is just improv. And if if I can do that with very rudimentary editing software, think about what, you know, Paul Feig could have done if he had actually had some kind of vision for this story. I don't even know if... Like, I know he didn't write all of it. I think he worked on a variant draft. But, by God, the... You know, I think you could have handpicked any female uh, authors and they would have written a better story. I mean, Harold Ramis helped write it... uh, the the first uh, Ghostbusters film, why not have one of the um, one of the cast of the film write it, at, you know, as they're going, you know, um, you know, tap them to do it. Um, just thinking, like maybe Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, and just have, just have all four of the Ghostbusters work on it and write it for them to do as a story. I don't know what their writing experience is, but heck, have Tina Fey write it. She can write a decent comedy. It would it probably would have actually been even better. But you know, I just I was I was really disappointed by it just because the story wasn't that good. And I felt like trying to bill it as a feminist tome wasn't uh sufficient to make it uh, a worthwhile film to watch. And, you know, that's not knocking on the actresses or knocking on uh, the uh, the ability of the actresses playing the Ghostbusters. I was A-OK with their casting. I was like, OK, sure, whatever. Once again, you've got three whites and a, and a woman of color. But... You know, we'll go with it. Whatever. But, you know, I actually ended up liking Shirley Jones a lot. She did a great job. Um, but, like, Shirley Jones and Kate McKinnon ended up being my favorite characters out of the entire film. I think Kate McKinnon's character was on the autism spectrum. So, at any rate... I could deal with a lot of the stuff in the film. I enjoyed a lot of the stuff in the film, but some of the stuff in the film just ended up falling so flat simply because it got dragged off. So the result was a better film after my editing. It held together better, it had a better feel, and all I did was subtract. I didn't add anything really. Um, so, yeah, that's basically, um, you know, what we're dealing with at this point. Uh, and I'll include a link to my fan edit of the film for you, uh, in the description. I couldn't load it onto YouTube without it being blocked. So it's on Vidme. Uh, it's not public, but you can view it with the, um, with the link. So hopefully... That'll do something for you. Anyway, that wraps it up. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.